So, so Chris, how you doing, my friend? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm just getting my getting my steps in. You know what I'm saying? That's what I got to do. I got to get the steps in because, like, when you're on the computer all day, the only thing that gets activated is not your ass for sure. It's just <laughs> everything switches off. So I like to move a little bit and get a little bit of low level activity in. But all is great here, brother. How about yourself? All is fantastic, man. Fantastic. It's um, ten minutes past five in the afternoon or evening, as some people might call it. Um, but I was up super early. These days, I'm waking up before my alarm clock. And my alarm is at half three in the morning. So, wow. yeah. You know, it was like, I was, I was part of the five o'clock, um, was it, what do you call it? The five o'clock club for a yeah. long time. But I thought, it's just, it's not cutting it. I need to get up earlier. Because my daughter started getting up earlier as well. And I was like, this ain't working. So uh, I went for half four, then it went to four. <laughs> and now I'm at half three. And it's working. Wow. It's so working. What, what time are you going to bed then? Um, I'm normally feeling tired about seven ish. I'm like, mm, okay, start winding down. And sometimes I'll fall asleep by half seven, eight o'clock. Wow. So, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. So I'm a little bit behind you. I usually go to bed about eight o'clock. Uh, but and I'm usually up about four. 30 i'd say four between four and uh, five we'll throw it in there but it's usually about 4 30 that i'm up but I'm, I, I'm with you man i gotta get those early evenings in and it's funny because now we're going into summer and uh you know uh, the the wife will be saying well you, got, you can't be going to bed now it's still light outside i'm like yeah i've, I've got the blackout blinds and I, I do have the you know the face mask if i need it if she comes in with a light on but I feel so much better getting up early because like, I know we have our routines. We're creatures of habits. We like to do, whether it be the red light therapy, meditation, uh, you know, or cold therapy, whatever, and then get through our own stuff before the distractions of the day and having to put out the fires. And I think it's very important that we set our intentions for the day very early without distraction, without noise, because, you know, these things, these devices, mm. they just they just control us, you know. So people think they're connected through those things. No, no, no. We need to reconnect first thing in the morning with ourselves. Man, that's so, so true. And that was that's one of the things for me with waking up early. You know, it's 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 my moment for me in a selfish way. I love this for me. You know, wake up early and then, you know, just do the whole morning routine and it feels good and um, so I'll go for a cycle in the morning. I'll cycle for around 10 miles, between 10 to 12, 12 miles a day. And that is my uh, outside? Is outside. That outside or? Yeah, outside. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Take the bike and I'll just go around the town and, so you know, uh, through, through some forests and look at the trees. And sometimes I'll stop and I'll, I'll just like, just, just admire, you know? Uh, listen to podcasts, audio books. It's such a beautiful moment for me. I'm like, oh man, I wish I could stay here a little bit longer, but let's get moving. Let's get moving. And then, um, yeah, it's a, it's a great time to just piece the day together. Like, like, okay, you know, think about things or listen to a podcast. And, you know, that's, that's like my study time as well, because like, I'm busy during the day working on different projects and emails and stuff like that. Um, that this moment is like I, I it's really productive for me where i can i can like listen to some audio books or podcasts or just just clear my mind you know yeah it's set, like you said it sets your intention for the day isn't it if you wake up in the morning putting out fires you you you, you kind of go into the day in uh more of a like a, a sympathetic state you know your cortisol yeah. you feel somewhat anxious throughout the rest of the day and sometimes it just comes out of nowhere so but if you start off with that and obviously we're always a work in progress we never quite get it but we can still work at it yeah what is it how does your morning start what what in fact what i would like to know is um what is your morning stack like <laughs> i know, I know I've, I've seen you go through supplements like all the time and i know you got like just a stack uh, upon stack um yeah take me through it bro i want to learn well I, I don't take my supplements until later in the, in the morning 
okay. A, a lot of them because, you know, I'll usually have a lot of them with, with food. Yes. But uh, the, the routine in the morning is I, I wake, you know, so, so after I've woken up, I either have, I, I usually have a coffee, but at the moment I'm going, you know, I'm going through a complete sort of like detox where I'm the only coffee that I'm taking is via enema on a, every Mondays, you know, every Monday. Okay. But I, I'm, I'm having homemade bone broth at the moment. Like I absolutely love uh, bone marrow. So, you know, I'll, I'll have the bone marrow and then I'll throw the bones into the pot and I'll make uh, bone broth. I'll put some turmeric, some ginger, some salt in there. And I'm having bone broth as my, like my morning sort of wake up call. And then I'll mix in some functional mushrooms in there. I'll put some ashwagandha in there as well. And uh, I'll have some shilajee uh, put in there as well. So I mix that uh, usually together. Usually I have the shilajee in the coffee, but I, I'll, I'll throw it in, in here at the moment at the bone broth. And then I'll stretch for a good 15 minutes. I like to stretch and I don't do that just from a physical standpoint, but I think it kind of like opens up your mind, your chakra to a certain degree. Yeah. You know, when I feel more flexible, I just feel better within myself overall. So I'll usually do that, and uh, at that time, you know, I, I know that you're very much aware of this. You know, I use the flex beam at the moment at the same time as I'm stretching on my tricep because I'm I tore my tricep uh, a couple of months ago. So that's you know I'm kind of stacking uh, that sort of biohack. Mm. Uh, once I've done that, I'll usually go straight to my cardio. Uh, you know, if I'm not working out in the morning because I've got a crazy day ahead, I'll usually go downstairs do my cardio and that's usually like on my curved treadmill. I've got a walk bike. I'll jump on a walk bike mm -hmm. or combination of those things. And then uh, that's when I come upstairs, always straight into my sauna then, get an infrared sauna for about 20, 25 minutes, jump in my ice bath for about three minutes. This is why I'm moving as I'm talking to you now to warm back up a little bit because I know with, with every minute that I spend in the ice bath, it takes me about an hour to kind of defrost. So if I'm in there for three minutes, I'm defrosting for like three hours. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, and if I'm not, I, I usually fast on my non-training days, but on my training days, I'm usually, you know, eating my, the normal typical bodybuilders, six meals a day. So uh, then when I have my breakfast, that's when I'll take my supplements. And the supplements, we could be here forever. There's probably about 60 tablets I'm taking a day. You know, but you know, it's all you know. It's not just for the sake of it. It's all relevant to my blood work, to my DNA tests. I just had another test uh, results come through yesterday, actually. Actually, so I'm still trying to optimize certain levels, like my vitamin D. I don't absorb vitamin D through photobiomodulation, so I have to supplement very, very high, and I have to take like an emulsion form of it because my gut just destroys. The vitamin D it doesn't just does not get absorbed, so I have to put an emulsion on the inside of my um, on the inside of inside inside of my uh, cheek there, you know. So, yeah, that's that's pretty much the start of my day. And usually, if I'm in my infrared sauna, I'll listen to a book, an audio book, or a podcast like yourself. And uh, at the moment, it's uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's uh, Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. I'm listening to that for like the second time now, you know. Right. What has he got? An audio book. Yeah, he's got quite. Yeah, he's got quite a few uh, audiobooks, and that's what I usually listen to audiobooks in the morning, and then I'll read, and that's usually something about you know, it's either self development or business yeah. or something like that. And then in the evening, I'll read something fun, like an autobiography. I'm reading uh, Pete Townsend's autobiography in the evening. Something that'll kind of chill me out. It's not going to get me thinking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's amazing. I didn't know that. Uh, yeah, he had a, another. Audio book. He's got quite a few. Did you you say yeah. Joe Dispenza? Yeah, Dr. Joe Dispenza is yeah, phenomenal he's got, person. He's got loads of audio books. I've I, yeah. swear, I think I've got two of his and I haven't been through them all. <laughs> they're, they're so detailed, they're like 39 hours each or something like that. Yeah, but they're the kind that you can listen to several times because you're just not gonna pick it up all on the first go around. It's like yeah. God, he's how what? You know, it kind of goes over my head a little bit. So I have to listen to it a couple of times and pick up little nuggets. He's got a seminar that's happening now or retreat, I should say, mm. uh, next month in uh, Cancun. Uh, as soon as I saw this Cancun, I was like, no, I'm not going. I don't want to go back. I don't want to go back there. Uh, so I'll wait till the next one comes around. I may actually go to one of his retreats. I don't usually go to those 
uh, in person, really, but I think his would have value. You know, yeah. like you, you'll have these Tony Robbins weekends away that I know a lot of people do. I've had friends go to those. I've got no interest. You know, I love what Tony Robbins does, but I've got more interest in uh, something what Dr. Joe Dispenza says because I'm not interested so much in business. I'm interested in myself. Yeah. You know, yeah. and like you, like you know, you said earlier. Well, you want your time that's selfish but i don't think it's selfish because it allows you to be selfish selfless because if you felt like shit because you put other people first and not yourself then what sort of person are you going to be a be to be around you know you're in the service industry just like me mm. we wouldn't be able to serve well if we didn't spend time on ourselves that's, you know and i yes. think yeah we've got to radiate that from within Exactly. That, that is exactly how I feel about it. I need to feel phenomenal if I'm going to give out phenomenal energy. Um, it's like you can't, it was that saying you can't allow someone to sip from your cup if it's empty or something like that. Yeah. You know, and you know, if, if you're the one who has to, yeah, if you don't keep refilling it, then you're just going to run dry. But yeah, like it's, it's so important, man. And, um, now I've got the PEMF. I do the red light therapy in the morning. I've actually started to introduce yoga. So oh, perfect. Yeah. I'll get I'll get the PMF mat out and I'll do it on that. And I'll, I've also got the grounding mat and I'll stretch and have some chakra music playing and I'll get the um, the crystals around me and stuff. Yeah, man. Nice. That's the red way. Light. Yeah. So serious, That's it, man. Perfect. I like the sound of that. I like the sound of that. And uh, with the yoga, are you doing that more so from like uh, more of a, more of a internal, spiritual, mental standpoint, or from a physical standpoint where you can increase your flexibility as well? I'm, I'm trying to combine both. I'm trying to combine yeah. both. Like I make sure that the light is dim. As I said, it's red. Like my mind is focused. I'm, I'm doing the breathing as I'm doing it, you know, just really engaging. Sometimes I'll have a candle on um, or I'll just have the light and I'm just trying to, just trying to uh, engage like with my higher self. Yeah, in a, in a very spiritual way. Um, so I'm trying to um, tap into different areas of myself, like real physical strength, the longevity, um, you know flexibility and like healthy mind state as well and i think with that you know with the um, with the yoga it really does help my mind to be in a good place yeah yeah no um, doubt no doubt do, do yeah. you use crystals at all yeah so i've got various crystals mostly introduced to me uh, by sybil you know my wife because she's oh. really really into it uh, in a big way uh, so yeah yeah we've got quite a few crystals around the house if i go traveling she gives me certain uh, crystals to take with me, to protect me, you know? Uh -huh. And, uh, you know, there's certain crystals that you can have. I can't remember the name of them. They're black ones that can help, uh, supposed to mitigate EMF damage and all that sort of stuff. Like my massage therapist, she actually uses them uh, as well, like for her son, because she found out that her son was electrosensitive. And when they actually... And I put these crystals on the one side where they found a lot of the dirty electricity in his bedroom. This skin condition that he's got was cleared up. Very, mm -hmm. very fascinating, you know. Uh, but I do, I do like that. You know, we went to what's called a sound therapy bath here. Uh, not the weekend just gone, the weekend before, where it works on another vibration where they have crystals there, but they use sound as that vibration because, you know, obviously our body is made up of water where that vibration helps uh, calibrate and reset you to a certain degree. And mm. I first got introduced to that when uh, we went to, I think it was Costa Rica, it was Costa Rica some years ago and absolutely loved it, really, really loved it. So we found a couple of places here locally uh, that do it and they combine it with the crystal therapy as well. So I really like that, I really like that, yeah. So with the sound thing that you said, have you tried something called um, oh, Gaines Wave or Gaines? Uh, <laughs> Gaines Wave. <laughs> yeah. uh, I know all about it. I know all about it. Okay. Yeah, the, ga the Gaines Wave. Yeah, the so, Gaines Wave, yeah. Yeah, so I, I know about it. Like I know this, uh, for instance, this um, woman that I just met with uh, last week, Nicole, she works at uh, Regenerative Medicine, 
spa here, I, I'd call it. And they just did my most recent blood test, you know, because I wanted to find out where my testosterone levels were, my, my micronutrients and, and, and whatnot. And they actually do the gains wave there with the P shot and the O shot. So yeah, fully aware of the gains wave. Yeah, yeah. It's quite interesting because I remember, who is it I interviewed? Oh, shoot. What is the lady's name? Amy Killen, Dr. Amy. Oh, yeah. yeah, she, she works with Dr. She works with Dr. Harry Adelson here over in uh, uh, Colorado. OK, OK. So, yeah, that was the first time I heard about the whole, um, yeah, the shockwave therapy in the penis. And I was like, really? Yeah. OK. And so then ben, ben Greenfield went through a huge experiment, didn't he? I don't know if you're aware of that. It was in Men's Health magazine, I believe. God, it was several years ago, several years ago. And they said, we want to see if any of these treatments work. And they reached out to Ben to see if he'd be up for it. And they did everything. You name it. He was on it to see <laughs> if it actually worked over a six month period or something. And Games Wave and the P shot was uh, one of those therapies. And he went to AB for that. So the, the goal of it is to um, what harden your erections? Uh, is it supposed to grow your penis as well? Like, what, what are you supposed to achieve out of it? I think it's supposed to be both, but yeah, it's mostly to harden the erections. That's right. what it is. Yeah, that's, is, the, that's the thing. Is that for people who have issues or is it for uh, penis longevity? Well, I think, it's, it, I think it's more so for people that have issues, however, it's, it's supposed to improve the sensitivity as well. So you have heightened uh, orgasmic uh, flurries, if you, if you want to call them, you know? Right. So I think it's a, it, that's what it's supposed to do. And it definitely does that with the females as well when they have the O shot because some of the females, they just lose the sensitivity there after, after a while. Some people less than others. And uh, that's one of the main reasons why the females have it done, from my understanding. Right, right, right. You've done like lots of different these like I don't know half iron and triathlon and uh, what, what what running man <laughs> what, what is it? <laughs> yeah. So I, I do, yeah, I, I do uh, Ironman triathlon. I've done a few of those now. I've done some halves as well and uh, Olympic distance uh, triathlons and uh, ultra marathon and uh, some Spartan and stuff like that. So I like to try to keep versatile. Uh, as much as possible i just like to move like there's a lot of people out there that just don't like cardio the majority of my clients hate cardio i love cardio i love it I always have so i've always done cardio once if not twice a day i've just really really enjoyed it um you know does it lead to a little bit of overtraining if i check my hrv sure it does but i love the stimulant from it you know the mental stimulant i just feel so much better so I will take a little bit of overtraining. I'm good with that, uh, just to have so much more satisfaction. You know, I, I'm here in the hills in uh, Boise, Idaho, you know, and I love it. I love the outdoors. That's why I'm living here. You know, I love going mountain biking, hitting the trails, going camping, uh, hiking, all, all that sort of stuff. But even when I'm back in Wales, you know, I still love it. I'll go up Snowdon whenever I have the opportunity. I'm straight to North Wales, straight to Snowdon hike it either by myself or with someone or with dad or something like that. Have you done Snowden? I've been there a couple of times before, yeah. Yeah, yeah. absolutely love. I love that hike, you know, the highest peak in Wales. It's, it's just phenomenal. And I love that area. There's something, something. it's kind of like the land of the hobbits. And uh, <laughs> it, it's very satisfying. So being out in nature and moving is just very satisfying to me. But even if I'm indoors and on a Stairmaster, I like to just throw on the headphones you know, listen to, uh, you know, like a podcast or something. I love it. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Definitely feel you there. What about if somebody wanted to start, try and do the things that you've done there, you know, the half iron and that. Like, what, what is it in aid of? Like, first of all, what type of training would you need to do in preparation? And what would you be doing in those types of um, challenges, sports challenges? It, well, it all, comes, it all comes down from the background. Like, I just had somebody compete, one of my clients... Uh, and his wife compete in the St. George Ironman over the weekend. Broke his record, but his previous record by about an hour and uh, did really, really well. And this is the first time he's done weight training alongside with preparing for an Ironman. So the three disciplines, for those that don't know, uh, is like if you're doing a full Ironman, you're doing like a 2.3 mile swim, 
and then you're following that up with uh, like a 114 mile cycle ride and then you immediately go into a 26 mile run so it's a, a full marathon at the end of it so it's taxing on your body is it the healthiest thing definitely not uh, but the preparation uh, needed for that is not so much in those distances you know like if you think about it running is going to be the most stressful thing that you can do more runners get injured than bodybuilders you know there's without a doubt so i always suggest that people shorten their distance for running and start very little and whenever possible do it like on a, a woodway curve because it's less impact or hit the trails do not do so much running on hard surfaces you know like roads because if you're a heavier person like yourself or uh, myself then that, that's a lot of stress. However, where we can go a little bit longer and further is on the cycle because it's less stressful. So I like to get my clients either go really intense for shorter amount of times, like HIIT training, where we'll do you know various various forms of uh, you know uh, intensities for about forty-five to sixty minutes during the week. However, and that'd just be a couple of times, just a couple of times, because we remember we're trying to combine this with you know, swimming and running as well. And then on the weekend, that's when we go long and slow, just to get used to time in the saddle. Because as you can imagine, on one of those little saddles for, you know, like six hours, it's, it's pretty uncomfortable. So that's when, you know, we may go for as long as a hundred mile ride on a weekend every now and again. But, you know, we're up early, we leave really early and we're back by one o'clock. You know, we still got the rest of the day uh, ahead. But, you know, that, that's kind of what it looks like. And then from the swimming, again, if you're a bigger person, we're just trying to be um, hydrodynamic. We're really working on technique. And then once we've got that technique dialed, then we start doing sprints in the water. And that could be with various tools, whether that be paddles for our hands to help with the drag, which causes a lot of resistance onto the lats and the triceps. As you push away so you know you really feel it you really feel it and you know sometimes we make sure that the legs are taped together so we're just working on upper body strength and then we start working from the hips for the lower body strength as opposed to the quads and trying to get the butt up because whenever i'm working with people that are generally on the more muscular side we swim like that like a boat you know like the legs just sink mm. so we're really trying to work with uh, buoyancy more than anything but uh, the, the, the hard part is, is trying to combine, you know, like the bodybuilding style workouts with the endurance, you know, trying to make sure that they do not overlap and complicate each other. So initially when I got ready for my first Ironman uh, at the beginning of 2017, I was definitely overtraining because as you know, I'm a high volume trainer. I like to train with a lot of repetitions and I actually thought that would help going into something like running, swimming, biking, because that's a lot of repetitions, but it just led to a crazy amount of overtraining. So then, you know, checking my HRV data and how I felt, I just brought that volume right back. So I was doing more of the typical eight to 12 uh, repetitions, sticking to mostly compound movements or unilateral movements. And then I wasn't overtraining so much. So, you know, there's a lot of things that you kind of have to look at there. Wow, wow. I think um, it's something I'd love to do. Um, I'm a little bit scared of the swimming. Um, everybody is. Everybody is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Everybody is. Glad to know I'm not alone. I mean, I can swim. People th like when I tell people I can swim, they're like, "Really? But you're black." I'm like, <laughs> "I don't get it." I only found out years later that not many black people swim. Apparently, I just because you're so it's because you're so muscular, and that isn't very buoyant. You know, I, I was surprised, absolutely surprised when I got out of the water in my first Ironman, how many people that I was passing on the bike, which is the next discipline that you go into, that were really overweight. They were really overweight, but because they had that buoyancy, they're just great swimmers. You know? right. So if you think about it, you're very lean, you're very muscular, you're not going to be very buoyant, you know, and that's what we have to work with. And that's what we struggle with to begin with. But once we've got that hydrodynamic technique down, it's easy. You know, once you get to a certain point, you go, oh, wow, 
I guess I could swim for hours if I wanted because now I've conserved my energy. The only issue that we have is trying to conserve so much energy and fuel up as much as we possibly can because we don't want to kind of bonk when we're out, uh, you know, a, a mile out into the open water and we need fuel to get back. So, you know, you just got to keep that in mind. So talking of fuel, um, do you what do you have beforehand during and uh, what's the um, like the post obstacle um, nutrition follow up to make sure that you're you know you're yeah you're you're back to normal so uh, again my fuel is a little bit different to 99% of the people that are competing in Ironman because mm. I just have much more muscle a lot of these people you know for instance at my height five foot eight they're weighing about 150 pounds, you know, where I'm like 220 pounds. It's right. a bit different. Mm -hmm. So I have to have more fuel because I don't want to get catabolic either. I want to retain my muscle. <laughs> so beforehand, if you think about what you usually used to eat before a bodybuilding show, it's probably something along those lines. I'm carb loading. Carb loading on a lot of rice, a lot of oats, uh, a lot of potatoes, you know, anything just to fill my glycogen stores as much as possible. I may not be on as amount you know the amount of protein uh that you know you, you would get ready for a bodybuilding show because I, I don't need that amount of protein you know i'm just proteins i'm sparing through carbohydrate content and i'm also combining that with a lot of fats because the fats will slow down the release of those carbohydrates into the bloodstream so i'm conscious of having a lot of fat so you know the, let's say the morning of the event i'm having a huge bowl of oats I got some fruits in there, you know, blueberries. I got bananas in there, and I got some uh, some uh, almond butter in there, and I'll have a scoop of whey protein because I need something that's very light, easy to digest. Mm. Then when I get down to the race, and the race usually starts about five thirty six a.m., uh, you know, it's still dark at that time, mm. and um, and then I'll usually have about a banana, you know, maybe a banana about. 30 minutes before I jump into the water, something again, easy to digest. I definitely don't want to cramp when I'm in the water and I'm just staying hydrated, not so much with a huge amount of fluid, but I've got a lot of electrolytes in there as well. Maybe a little bit of salt uh, that I'll add to that as well, because dehydration is a big thing when you're out there in an Ironman, because let's say the day becomes really, really hot and you've been like I've been training in Boise, Idaho, but now I'm in somewhere like Coeur d'Alene and it's a lot hotter, then obviously I'm going to dehydrate a lot quicker. And if you've got headwinds as well, you know, you've been surprised how many more calories you burn through when you're cycling or running into headwinds. So you have to kind of err on the caution of consuming a little bit too much fuel or carrying a lot more fuel. And usually when I'm out there, you know, like I'll have maybe a gel just before I start the swim. But then when I start uh, the bike uh, and in the transition to the bike, that's when I start loading a lot of the, the fluids into me then. So I'll usually carry, let's say, three bottles and I'll probably go through six bottles when I'm on the, on the bike. In that, I'll have like a Vitago because that's a very easily to digest carbohydrate. The osmolality is just perfect for the gut permeability and I'll consume that, and then I'll have some whey protein and glutamine and essential amino acids in my bottle as well. Again, because I'm trying to conserve muscle fuel here as well. I don't wanna go uh, catabolic. And uh, th then I'll have quite a lot of fuel uh, in regards to food on the bike as well. So I've got a bag, a little bag on the front of the bike, and I've got energy balls in there that I've made with oats, dates, and whey protein and uh, like it's kind of mashed together with nuts as well. Right. So I'll eat that on the bike because it's very easy for me to eat while I'm cycling. It's not easy to eat, obviously, when I'm running. So that's when I'll usually just have gels. So uh, there's, there's several gels out there, a couple of brands like Hume that are really, really good because they don't have any artificial colors, flavors. You know, they're not chock full of caffeine or anything like that. Uh, so that's what I'll usually consume. If I'm having caffeine, I usually reserve it for the run and uh, I'll just have organic caffeine uh, tablets at that time. Mm. And then post, post race, it's funny, post race, they serve you free pizza, free burgers, free 
chip. And I'm like, no, I, wow. I don't want that right now. You know, my body is starving. It's just broken down. I can barely walk. So I'll usually just have, you know, typical healthy meals straight after a couple of healthy meals, usually back to back because I'm so hungry at that point. And then if I'm going to cheat, I'll cheat, you know, but I need to get the healthy food in me first. How long does it normally take to complete one of those uh, Ironmans? Uh, so it could take anywhere. You're going to get the really fast guys uh, doing it in a, probably like six, seven, seven hours, something like that. The faster guys, I should say. Mm -hmm. Six hours, yeah, really, really quick. But then you've got like an 18, I think it's an 18-hour cutoff. So you've got people finishing 18 hours later as well, you know? Mm. So it can, it, it, can take a, it can take a while. Wow. Almost a day. Yeah. Or well, you think about it. Or well, you think about it, you know, you're doing that 2.4 mile swim. Then you're doing a 114 mile bike ride. And these aren't flat surfaces usually. Yeah. They're very hilly courses. And, uh, and then you're doing a full marathon. Now, those individually could take time, but when you put them all together, you know, you're, you're, you're absolutely exhausted by, you get, by the time you get to the run a lot of the time. And now you've got to do a full marathon. You know, it, it can take people some time, especially when you have, there's no age limit. There's people in their 80s doing it, which is phenomenal. That's what I like about Ironman is that you could do this for the rest of your life, you know, as long as you heal your body now and not harm it. You could do that for the rest of your life. And a lot of people do it for charity as well. Let's say they lost their son, their mother, a loved one, a co-worker, and they're doing it to raise funds. Uh, you'll even see people that are amputees there uh, uh, participating. So it's a great community. And that's one of the reasons why I've just loved doing it and being a part of it, because the community and the camaraderie is just something unmatched. You know, like I stick out a little bit in these events and the support that I get uh, from people that, you know, could be passing me and they're, they're just, you know, they give me encouragement and it's phenomenal. I love it. You know, or I could pass someone and they'll say something that's encouraging, like, yeah. like huge carbs, dude, you know, whatever, you know, but everyone's really encouraging of each other. I love it. That's amazing. I did experience that at, um, I didn't do that event. It was it was an obstacle course. What's one of the obstacle ones called? Like Spartan, like uh, oh yeah. Not Spartan, but I tried to. I wanted to get on Spartan, but I yeah. I haven't. There's a there's a few of them out there. What's what's the main tough mudder? Oh, tough mudder. Yeah, yeah that was yeah. fun, and that was brilliant. Yeah. Like people were just helping each other and stuff, and that was so cool. I definitely want to do that again. I've also done another one called uh, the Nuclear Race, which is not as um not as not as much as those but it was a great introduction and my plan was to do it again for 2020 but then something happened <laughs> yeah, yeah. the whole world stopped for about a year yeah um so i've seen you post stuff about injuries in the past and obviously you have a current injury which you're healing from um so what type of injuries have you had over the years and what protocols have you used to help you to heal quicker uh, well, I've, I've had a lot of broken bones. I've torn a, a lot of uh, muscles, um, you know, like, God, I've got a long list because I, I was racing motocross from the age of like six years old. Uh, so, and I was playing rugby in school, but I've always had like a, a like a, and this, this isn't to my advantage by any means, but I've always had like a high pain threshold. Like I remember in school when I broke my wrist, and, uh, you know, my wrist had swollen up and I knew there's something wrong because I couldn't write with it. I just played rugby and uh, the teachers just, you know, I, I, I was in a very, very tough school in Wales at that time. And they thought that I was just, you know, coming up with an excuse to skive off school. But I knew there's something wrong. So in my lunch break, I went to the, the hospital and they said, yeah, you, you've broken your wrist in this many places so i went back to school that afternoon with a big plaster on to show it it wasn't an excuse you know so i knew from a young age you know i probably didn't recognize it at that time but i had a, quite a high pain threshold so i've actually got injured over the years and not really known that i got injured like uh, about seven years ago i was heliboarding in the himalayas and i ragdolled it crashing down a mountain and I tore my hamstring and it wasn't until I was getting ready for a photo shoot that I had in Australia where I was doing 
stiff like a deadlifts. And the photographer said, what has happened to your hamstring here? And then I looked at it, I was like, wow, that doesn't look right. And I went back to India and uh, got the MRI and the, like the belly, the hamstring belly had, had just atrophied because I'd torn it when I was, um, when I was snowboarding. And then, you know, I had surgery a few years ago on my shoulder, my supraspinatus, uh, my rotator cuff, my labrum needed to be sh uh, shaved as well. And I've separated both my AC joints, downhill mountain biking, going over the handlebars, tore my pec in the same crash. And uh, then the most recent was I tore the medial head and the lateral head off my tricep and the two tendons that junction it as well. So that's probably the most complicated injury that I say that I've had. Like I've broken my ankle, I've torn the tendons in my ankles and tearing the tendons I find are more painful than breaks. There's no doubt about it. I, I found it a little bit more uncomfortable. Yeah. And uh, so this most recent tricep injury has been the most complicated. So the things that I've been doing, you know, I use the flex beam on it every day yeah. uh, to try to help, you know, stimulate the collagen production there. Uh, I'm on uh, probably about 120 grams of collagen uh, a day. Um, I'm putting, I'm running a DC current through there from the newbie. Do you know the newbie new fit machine? So you put like, it's kind of, if you think of like a complex or, you know, a lot of those stimulation muscle pads that you put on, uh -huh. uh, like those are usually AC currents. So the AC current contracts, releases, contracts, releases. A DC current so it just grabs and it holds. So you can't really tear the muscle. Uh, you know, there's no risk. So I've been using that on my tricep just at home up until about two weeks ago, because now, uh, you know, eight, eight weeks post-surgery, I've been able to do some extension, been able to do some pressing. However, I cannot use a large amount of weight, obviously, because they had to drill holes through my humerus and my ulna to re-thread the tendons through and attach at the bottom. So there's still weakness there, you know, so I have to be very careful with that. So I apply the majority of the resistance through this machine whilst I'm performing the exercises. You know, so that allows me to rehab uh, a little quicker. I'm using a PEMF as well because that really helps with bone healing and, you know, having these holes drilled through my bones didn't help. So I usually have that machine on me, the DC current, the newbie at home whilst I'm lying on the PEMF mat at the same time. I'm taking uh, like six different peptides uh, that has been prescribed to me. So the usual BPC-157, TB-500, and then epimolin, uh, sorry, tesamolin, ipamolin, uh, folaskin, and 5-amino. So I'm on those at the moment. So I'm really, you know, throwing a shotgun approach to this thing. You know, there's right. no doubt about it. And high levels of antioxidants, like you're, you're obviously um, familiar with, uh, you know, the hydrogen rich water. So I, you know, that, that's very high antioxidants. I'm taking the, the ESS60 from my vital C, you know, the carbon 60 which is a Nobel winning carbon. So very high in antioxidants on that. I have my own supplement, which is a greens powder called Outlive 100. So I'll have that because there's high levels of antioxidants in there with turmeric, ginger, um, apple cider vinegar, etc. So going very, very high, high on those levels as well. And, you know, with this injury, I was told that I wouldn't be weight training for about six months after the surgery. And here we are eight weeks after I'm already weight training. So I'm, at, I'm, I'm, I'm ahead of what my physio is putting through, putting me through. So it's all going in the right direction. And I think mm. the, uh, the most important thing with any injury, the, the most important biohack, if you will, is the mindset. You know, you just have to be so positive, you know, don't be negative. Don't try to cry for sympathy. Uh, that's not going to help you, you know, and I think being very positive and optimistic and trying to turn this weakness into a weapon is going to do nothing but help, you know, and that's why as soon as this injury happened, I knew exactly what had happened straight away because I've, I've done these sort of things before. I, I listened to Dr. Joe Dispenza's book again, you know, straight away before the surgery, just to put me into that mindset of breaking the habit of being yourself and just, you know, going at it with a new slate, Mm, that's amazing. I remember watching a, I think it was a documentary on Usain Bolt. And 
you know, <clears throat> this guy being the fastest man in the world, he was still also really prone to injury. Yeah. Like he was, yeah, he was having injuries all the time. And it was, it was fascinating to, to the lead up to one of his competitions. He had, um, he had some sort of issue. I think it was the, um, oh, shoot. You'd mentioned the area around near your foot. What do you yeah, call was it? it the Achilles tendon? Yeah. That he had? Yeah. The Achilles tendon issue. I remember that. And uh, I was like, it was quite fascinating because, you know, he, he fast healed himself and then he ended up winning races and, you know, probably breaking another world record. And it's like, it's amazing to see like someone like yourself who, yeah, you're probably injury prone as well. It's probably in your DNA but you've still achieved so many things. It's unreal. And some people like say things like, uh, you know, oh, I can't do that because I'm not, I'm not big enough and all this sort of stuff. They have so many excuses. And you've got those who, you know, Paralympics people. It's, it's so, it's, it's fabulous to see that, you know, people just going against the grain or whatever obstacles life throws at them. It's like, yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, whatever. I'm still going to continue going anyway. I just yeah. love that mentality. It's incredible. So it, it, It's all from the neck up, isn't it, at the end of the day? People can compare themselves. You know, like, I, I'm not going to try to compare myself to you and say, look, I'm going to stay in shape all year round. I'm going to have a six-pack, and I'm just going to have, you know, massive biceps, whatever. It's just not in my DNA. But I can be a better version of myself. And when it comes to, you know... Like, I, I've always participated in extreme sports because I'm hooked on adrenaline. I love adrenaline, and I love things that's associated with individualism. So I've never been into team sports at all. You know, like I said, I did, I did rugby. But, you know, from a very young age, I was racing uh, motocross up until I was, like, 20 years old. So, of course, I mean, something that's going to, you know, that's very risky. Of course, I'm going to have injuries, which I did. And then I left that to go into downhill mountain bike racing. Again, something that's, uh, you know, I'm going to be injury prone. And then started snowboarding. Of course, you know, it's going to happen. I tore, I separate, I tore um, uh, my, uh, not my labor, my rotator cuff when I was surfing in, in Australia. So these things happen. It's funny because like people assume based on what we do, oh, that must have happened in a gym. It's like, no, when we're in a gym, we're, we're very focused. We're, we're, we're in the moment, you know, the chances of injury is less likely. But when you're out there biking or whatever you're doing, you're not thinking about that. It just happens in a split second, you know, and I think that's where the injuries come from. But, you know, it's the, the age old saying, like what Stallone said, it doesn't matter how many times you get hit, uh, knocked out, it's how many times you get back up. And like people will say, so you're not going to snowboard, or you're not going to do that now. And I'm like, I can't wait. <laughs> I can't wait because, you know, we only get one life and I don't want to have any regret. Sure, we can heal from injuries. Is it an inconvenient? Yeah, it is. But look, you, you sign up for these things. You know, if, you, if, if, if you're not kind of like, if, if you're scared of falling or hurting or crashing, yeah, then choose another sport. But I, I'm not scared of those things. And, you know, I have to learn to expect it. Mm -hmm. Makes so much sense, man. It's it is it's it's a part of life, you know. Sure. If, you, if you if you're gonna be, um, you know, tiptoeing in relationships, like oh, I'm afraid to get hurt. I've been hurt before. It's like what? You're never gonna get in a relationship. Just you have to give give it a go, risk it. That's what life is all about. Yeah, calculated risk. But you can't sit there like trying to, uh, yeah, trying to be uh, in your comfort zone too often. And it's the same with business, isn't it, really? If people, you know, you look at a lot of successful business people, think, you know, look at how many failures. You read their books, you know, well, like a Richard Branson's book or, you know, like we know that there was Virgin Cola, like what happened with that? And then there was the Virgin Record stores. Are they still around? Probably not, you know? So he's had a lot of failures, but you only learn from them. And they're not failures, they're just experiences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there is many like that. So true. How do you find dieting? I've seen your photos now and you're looking really good. Well, I, I don't know whether they're old photos. Nobody knows. It's funny because I post up pictures and people are like, oh, wow, where was you there? Like, are you there now? I'm like, look, I've got, 
I've got a moustache and beard now. You should yeah. know that it's not going to go and come back. <laughs> but people don't think about these things. So, but the thing is, you don't age, Roger. That's why you look at pictures of you like ten years ago to now. <laughs> you, you, your face looks the same, man. Oh man, thanks, brother. So, um, yeah, like looking at your photos, it was it was really nice to see that you really dialed in and. Um, yeah, and you was keeping it consistent. Was it a particular purpose? Uh, was it shoots, um, campaigns, or you just fancied a change? Well, this is what it, this is what it came from in the beginning. It was uh, the lockdown, you know, because everybody and, and people around me, friends, people half my age, it was doing my head in that everyone was justifying their excuses for putting on like a quarantine 15. I was like, <laughs> come on, guys. I was like, what, what is wrong with you guys? You know, I'm like, you've got your body weight. You know, you can move. And, you know, we didn't have the lockdown where we couldn't go outdoors here. So what? I, what, what what's with you guys? You know, so I thought, you know what? I'm going to put together a video series because if my social circle is like this, I wonder how many people around the world are going through this. So I thought I'm going to do a video series. So I did it. And uh, I had people signed up to follow like an eight week at home workout. It was like called the 60 day shred. So people could watch me every single day live at 7 a.m. Working out with just my body weight, resistance bands and a pair of dumbbells. And that was it. Well, you didn't have to have the dumbbells, but if you got resistance bands, great. You get to do these exercises. So I did that and I just went through this transformation. We finished in like October and uh, I just thought, you know, I feel good at this weight. I was definitely at my lightest weight because usually I'm training in a gym with heavy weights. Uh, but I felt really good and I felt versatile and I could still, you know, I, I felt good running the running the hills and stuff like that. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to hold this condition for a while, you know, and that's what I did. And, uh, you know, just you know, kept the condition through. I thought, well, let, let me see if I can just go through Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and just, you know, have this as a lifestyle uh, more than anything and utilize things that, you know, we've, uh, you know, interest, introduced ourselves to now over the last few years with fasting. You know, okay, if I want to enjoy Christmas dinner, then sure, but I'm just going to fast up until then and utilizing these tools and strategies to try to maintain some sort of balance because I've always purposely put on weight because I've just felt that's been very, very good for my hormone levels, you know, because when I diet, I go pretty strict. So when I get off a diet, I want my hormone levels to bounce back. And I've always felt good within my joints, uh, within my body by doing that. Even though it may not look good, I've just felt so much better with it. And, um, you know, I do my, you know, like I, 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 I'm sure you're aware of like the telomere tests and the glycanage tests. Mm -hmm. So I do them every six to 12 months, usually 12 months now, just to ensure I'm doing the right thing to bring them down. So you know, my most recent test was 25 years old at, at the age of a chronicle on a chronological age of 46, nearly 47 now. So it's going in the right direction. So I've enjoyed doing that balance and it, it's tend to work, but I feel better at a lighter body weight now. So I'm usually hovering around 200 pounds now. So I've dropped about 20 pounds and I just feel good with that. What is and that that's in kilos? In kilos, well, it's 2.2 pounds, isn't it, per... So I'd say it'd be probably like 92, 92 kilos or something like that, I guess. You know, where usually I'd be like over 100, 100 about 105 kilos. Mm, right, right. Yeah, so I feel I feel good. I feel good at that weight, you know. And and like I, I got myself a motocross bike. I got uh, sponsored by a company called uh, Carl Cycle. So they give me a KTM 250. So I've been oh, wow. back on back on that thing so it feels a bit better to kind of crash at a lighter body weight uh than being a heavier body weight on that so i think i'm going to keep it down here now have you find actual dieting though Is yeah I, I i've i've never had a problem with dieting like i'm not one of those people that gets uh cravings or anything like that i just enjoy putting on weight you know because i get a lot stronger in a gym and it doesn't put then too much stress like on my joints, like if when I'm dieted down, you know, I get a little bit niggling inflammation in my elbows, in my knees when I'm doing hack squats and things like that. Right. So I've never really had a trouble with dieting. I don't mind it. I like I like the challenge. I've just had a trouble with the side effects 
of like the stress on my joints and my connective tissue in the gym. That's it more than anything. But I'm not training as heavy as I used to. Uh, so I don't really need the extra body fat as much now. Right, right, right. Yeah, you know, I enjoy it, you know. I enjoy it. I love being really, really strict with my food. Um, but do you get any cravings at all? I only get cravings when I have shit food. When I have oh, it, right. then it's like crack. And then I go berserk. So, I, that, you know, as long as I keep away from it, I'm great, you know? But then when I have like a cheat meal or something, like uh, last week I did have, um, I had a pizza, which turned into four pizzas. And wow, then, whole pizzas? Yeah, whole, uh, they're like 10 inch or something. Wow. 10 inch pizzas. Um, and then, um, and then I was like, I, I, I was like, I should be full. I should be full. But then I wanted bagels. So I got some bagels. I think I had about another, maybe three, about three or four bagels. And then I crashed out. <laughs> crashed. And then, and then the following day, do you wake up super hungry because that's like kickstarted your metabolism? Next day, I had a lot of energy. I could, yeah, I powered it through to, I think, five o'clock the following day without anything, without no stress. It was easy. Um, but I did, I did have a taste for a bit of sin. I did have a little taste for it, but I was okay throughout the morning until late afternoon. Um, I think it's because I'm, I'm mindful of how much I ate. So I'm like, I tell myself, you should be fine. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, powered through the day, went for a long cycle, I think an hour and a half training. I think I cycled for about 14, about, between 14 to 16 miles, and then trained for about an hour and a half. It was good. <laughs> That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, at least you recognize that, you know, that if you do cheat, it could lead to more frequent cheats. And I think that's what a lot of people aren't aware of. They just think, oh, just a little bit here. And if I have a little bit there, I can then go and do two hours of cardio and burn it off, not knowing that it's not so much the cardio of burning it off and getting through those calories. It's that signal, that neuro pathway that they've told their brain, okay, I've given you a fix and now I'm going to give you another fix and then another, and then it becomes a habit. And you kind of, you know, it's like some people like to have that cheat. I've, I've heard this from clients. They like to have that cheat while they're scro scrolling through Instagram or something like that, because it provides a double like a dopamine rush for them, you know, <laughs> and, and people are addicted to that, but then they create a habit and they can't get out of it, you know? Yeah. It's, I mean, it said when you, when you're eating, you should be mindful and um, you shouldn't be doing other stuff anyway. Exactly. Exactly. Is it TV scrolling? Yeah. There, there's a book called the slow down diet and it's a really, really good. And he talks about the importance of the digestion and the digestive tracts. Like it's like if you're, you know, if you're training in the gym and you're having a chat to somebody at the same time as you're training your bicep, you're not going to develop that bicep because you haven't got that mind muscle connection. And it's the same thing with eating your food. If you're distracted, you're not able to assimilate or digest that food properly. So after you've eaten, you haven't even registered it and you're still hungry. And you're like, what else can I eat? But you've had enough. And this leads to obviously a bad habit of overeating. So, you know, he tells you that, you, you know, you must be mindful. You take your time before you eat your food. Doesn't matter if you fasted for 24 hours. You look at it. You appreciate what's in front of you, the color. And then when you're eating it, you think about the texture, the taste, how many times you're going to chew it, really enjoy it. And obviously, you know, you're slowing down then. That's what's called the slow down diet. So once you've consumed that meal, now you are fulfilled. You don't need a cheat. You don't need to overeat or eat anymore. And I try to do that now. You know, it's kind of like a spiritual quest. Okay, no distraction. I'm going to eat slowly, mindfully, and be present and, and be grateful as well. Because like we've traveled to India before, and we see that, you know, there's a lot of people there on the streets. They have no idea where their next meal is coming from. They don't know if they're going to be able to eat. And they'll take anything. And here we are complaining that we've got dry chicken breast and rice, you know, shame on us, you know? 
Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm definitely not that person. Like it it's funny because um if if I'm cooking at home, um let's say my daughter, she might say, um, Daddy, I don't want that. I want this. But the thing is, she might keep asking me. She might like might tell me, Daddy, when's dinner ready? Daddy, when's dinner ready? When's it when's it ready? And then and then it's ready and she's like, oh, I don't want to eat that. <laughs> but you're hungry. Yeah, but I don't want that. What are you talking about? You know, and you actually get people like that. You know, she's not the only one. You've got adults like that as well who are very particular. They're like, it has to be this or this. And there's hardly, I don't think there's any foods. Well, there are some foods, but I think my threshold or my, my taste bud is, is, is very expansive in terms of flavors, which I'll eat. Um, I think textures from things like squid, I find uncomfortable. Um, I used to really dislike liver, but I've, in, I've, I've started to introduce that, so I'm good with that. I'll have that like once a week. Have you tried um, heart? Like beef heart or anything like that? No, I've seen it, I've looked at it, and I'm like, I'll stick with liver for now. Um, I was looking at the nutritional profiles and liver seems to be, you know, um, I, I think they've all got different stuff. I don't know like whether the heart has got more coenzyme or something I don't, I don't know what's what's the i think it's higher in zinc i think it's higher in zinc and b vitamins isn't it from from what i recall but the the, the what i've done with people that i've tried to introduce to organ meat is to maybe start with heart because it doesn't taste as gamey or as much as an organ as like liver or kidneys you know where you really have to marinate it like i do like to marinate it with like some kefir or some apple cider vinegar for some garlic, ginger, you know, turmeric, stuff like that. And there's some salt, you know, do that over the night and, you know, bash it with a, with a mallet. And that's really good. But I find like, for instance, my wife, she's just not into that at all, but I've introduced her first by a heart and that, 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 that tend to work. Right. Right. Okay. Oh. What I've done as well is um, made a pate. I think that's really oh, nice. nice. Like a How do you do have a pate. How do you do that? Do you blend it or what? Yeah. Put it in a food food processor? I just blend it. So Interesting. fry it. You can, you know, put some seasonings in it and um put some onions in it. Um you can use so coconut oil or olive oil, whatever, and then just put it in the blender. And then whatever you decide you want to put in there. Recently I tried to put some dates in there. <laughs> and, and it was fine. I liked it. Really? Like, because I do like the contrast in flavors. I'm that sort of person, you know, where I'll have like, let's say a bowl of salad with like, I don't know, some chicken and some, uh, uh, some prawns and some um, uh, um, anchovies, but then I'll chuck an apple in there and maybe some raisins and, you know, have some other yeah. types of fruit. Like I'll mix all of that and I love all that. So I thought, let me just try and put a bit of sweetness in this and it tastes good. Tastes Interesting. Good. It really depends so when, on the person. When you have that pate, do you have it by itself or you spread it on something? I might spread it on like on some uh, Ezekiel bread or something yeah. like that. Um, or I might just put it on the side and have it almost like a condiment with other types of food. Even if I'm eating chicken, I might still dip the chicken in there or something like that. You yeah, know? that's a great idea. Have you got this? Have you got this recipe written down anywhere? No, but I no. could text it to you i just okay. I, I just decided to experiment and uh it worked so there's some others i want to try it with um other types of fruity stuff um but yeah well that's it yeah. really i mean i can yeah i could text it to you yeah please do that sounds awesome because i got loads in the freezer downstairs and i i, I love pate like when i was in the uk i used to have like duck pate uh you know when i was first yeah. getting into bodybuilding i didn't know what to eat so i was like put that on my bread with some spring onions and, and whatnot, and just try to force feed down, uh, try to put on weight. And I just haven't had pate for a long, long time, but I just love it. So I'd yeah. love to get that recipe. Yeah, yeah. It's yeah, yeah. another way of eating it. And that's another way that you can introduce other people to it, I guess, because just don't tell them what it is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, What's this? This is nice. <laughs> then you tell them. Yeah. Um, I was going to say, so um, uh, what are the five top biohacks you would say, if you, if you had to choose five top biohacks uh, that is like the ultimate biohacks, but I'm talking about equipment. 
Okay, not equipment. like natural biohacks. Right, I was going <laughs> to come up. I was going to come up with the three ones first. Then, <laughs> yeah, um, I was going to. I'm, I'm actually going to say that afterwards, like you know, the the, the free ones. But uh, yeah, like in terms of equipment, what would you say is the five top ones you reckon people should have, uh, regardless of price? Just the five top ones. Okay, well, it all depends on what that person needs to work on, I, I guess, isn't it? But um, I'd say, you know, I, I love, you know, the blue light blocking glasses because the majority of us live in a, an environment where we're just penetrated all the time with artificial light. And as we know, that flicker just puts us, can put us into that sympathetic state, raises our cortisol levels because our pupils are constantly flickering, dilating. And uh, so I, I, I think that's really good. Like, you know, usually if I'm on a computer all day, I'm wearing a clear lens. If I'm in a gym underneath, you know, the, some of the gyms that I train at here just have such artificial, bad artificial strong lights, you know, strip lights. And usually we're on our back doing flies or press, just staring straight at that light. So I'll wear the yellow lens then. And a couple of hours before bed, I have the red lens, even though I do have like the, the, the bulbs all throughout the house. I've got the yellow bulbs downstairs and I've got the red ones upstairs. So it looks like a brothel uh, upstairs in, in my house. Uh, but of course, we're still, we've got screens, we've got TV, we've got uh, standby lights everywhere. So I think that's, that's, that, that, that's my number one, you know, yeah. blocking the blue light because we're on the phone and, and whatnot, you know? So I, I, really, I really like that concept. Uh, I love the red light, the red light therapy. So I think, you, do you use like the uh, the red light rising panels? Is that what you use or not? Yeah, I've got the um, the, the advantage panels. Yeah, Advantage yeah. 1500. Yeah, so I love that. I absolutely Amazing. love that. There's just so many benefits to it. You know, it can help optimize nitric oxide production, testosterone production. Um, you know, I use it mostly to help set my circadian rhythm because I come from a background of just, terrible sleep like three to four hours sleep from mold toxicity uh that i got in uh, 2012 i just didn't know that i had it i it, it took me to go i had to go to a clinic called dr spinard's uh, clinic in oldsmar florida in 2014 to get diagnosed with mold toxicity because i'm like what is wrong with me i was just an angry person i was a terrible person to be around and i just wasn't sleeping i was like three, sleeping three four hours a night so I use the red light to set my circadian rhythm because there's no sunlight when I wake up and same with you. And you know what the British winters are like, they're pretty, very similar to Idaho as well. There's just no light. So, you know, getting exposure to help set that circadian rhythm is great. And then probably one of the reasons why you look so young, Roger, is great for collagen production as well. <laughs> so, you know, there's just so many benefits to it. Um, you know, I, I think red light therapy is phenomenal for people, you know, especially if you're not going to get outside. A lot of us do work indoors. Uh, so, you, you know, you, you get the restorative red frequencies and rays from uh, that you would get from from the sun. Um, and then an earthing mat. Uh, you know, I know that you use an earthing mat as well. So I, I use you know, those from, uh, you know, Clitoba's uh, brand. Uh, so Which one? Sorry. Which one? Clint, Clint Ober's brand. It's earthing.com is the website. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I use, I use theirs. You know, I had um, Brian Hoyer come through my house a couple of years ago and he's like uh, one of the world's leading building biologists just to check how, how much dirty electricity has come through my house. And then obviously frequencies that are penetrating the house. Now we've got 5G that we're exposed to obviously. So I do whatever I can to earth myself because I know I'm getting penetrated by all these uh, frequencies and EMF on a daily basis. So it's very important that we don't have it all penetrate and sit within us. We need to earth it out of ourselves. So I have an earthing mat at my desk here. I've got one up at my bed. Uh, you know, I take them when I'm traveling for sure. And I have like the little earthy bars I think you probably have them that Tim introduced us to. Yeah, uh, yeah that go yeah. get go on the on the minimalist shoes. So uh, you know, I do. I think that's that's important for a lot of people, especially uh, if you're the kind of person that's just if if you're within an environment, especially in the middle of a city where you're just getting penetrated by Wi-Fi routers and stuff like that. Like I have a client who is a dentist. And he's obviously exposed to x-rays all the time. So 
know, one of the things that I did was get into Earth all the time and get like the Defender Shield, you know, cases for the phone to mitigate a lot of the damage. And his sleeping has just improved. You know, if you look at his data, yeah, you've got the Defender Shield headphones. I see that. Uh, the only problem is with those, you know, you've got the weight there. You've got the weight. Mm -hmm. That is good, you know, for what me and you are doing now. But I notice when you take, when you go into the gym, that weight just pulls them out of your ears, unfortunately. But I said, have you got the clips around the ears? Um, where it just fits in. No. Yeah. 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 See, it's perfect for what we're doing now. That's the only, that's my only feedback. It's like, they keep coming out my, my, uh, my ears, you know. But I think that's, that's, that's very important. And then mitigating whatever damage uh, that you can from EMFs as well. Because if, I don't know if you're electrosensitive, but I definitely am. And I noticed this when I came back from Vegas uh, uh, several years ago, where I was at a music festival, wasn't drinking, wasn't doing any drugs, but I came back and I felt like I had a hangover for about five days. And nobody's phone was working in the Speedway area where this music festival was held because there were so many people compact in this thing. And there was just that many people on phones, you know, like over 100,000 people. And I just felt like, wow, I was... And I spoke to a couple of other people within our group. There's about 20 of us and there was about four of us that were just shattered after the event. And I believe it was because from just from the penetration of uh, the emf so you know having like the defender shield phone cases like i've got the defender shield mat underneath my computer um you know i wear the clothes as you probably do from get lambs mm -hmm. especially while traveling i think that's a very important biohack as well because look we really don't know the damage that it could be doing and i don't think it's a coincidence that we see, especially in young, healthy adults, testosterone levels just plummeting year after year after year. You see cancer rates increasing year after year after year. Of course, you know, we've got the introduction of vegetable oils and excess sugar and stuff like that as well. But, um, I, I, you know, our DNA hasn't changed and I just think it's a little too coincidental. And, uh, you know, when you see just through heat radars, how it heats up and lights up parts of your brain or wherever that phone is stored on you, it just seems a little too coincidental. You may say it's a little woo-woo, it's a little tinfoil hat, but I, I think it's very important when you consider like the x-rays that we have uh, and all that sort of stuff. And the other thing mm. that I really like is the, you know, the, the sauna. I think that's great because we are exposed now to so many heavy metals through our water supply, through pollutants, in our foods, you know, you know, especially here in the US. Like in the UK, it's not so bad when it comes to heavy metals or mold toxicity in foods. But if Europe rejects them, the US usually says, we'll have it, we'll yeah. take it. Yeah. So then us as a consumer are actually consuming it. So you know, as long as you're able to collate it, maybe through the right supplements, um, you know, like Corella, spirulina, uh, activated charcoal, etc., then you can, you know, get rid of a lot of these heavy metals through the perspiration in your sauna. So I think that's, that's very important as well. Yeah, yeah. That's incredible, man. And it's funny that I think what you, everything you mentioned, I probably would have said the same thing. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'll say that. Yeah, I'll say that as well. It's, and it all, it, yeah, it all makes sense. And I think a lot of people are really not aware about the whole grounding thing and um, protecting themselves from EMF. Like, that's a big deal, man. I think that's like, that's like a major one. It's amazing. Yeah. Like, have you watched Earthing the movie? Um, no, no. But check that out, Earthing the movie. Clint has obviously got the book, Earthing, Earthing the book, but the movie is phenomenal. It's absolutely phenomenal. I highly recommend that to anybody that's kind of on the fence, that goes, oh, it seems a little bit hippy-bippy to me, you know, I'm not going to go that way. But as soon as they see the movie, they're like, I'm sold. Yeah. Because you have a lot of respected scientists and doctors and real life uh, reviews on there, it's just phenomenal. You know, like my father is definitely not into any of that. He's very cynical uh, towards that sort of stuff. He's earthing every day now, you know? That's amazing. I've got like an earthing sheet on my daughter's bed 
And she, yeah, she, yeah, she uses that all the time and she does uses the red light therapy in the morning and PEMF. Like she nice. just does it naturally now. It's so great to see her do that, you know? Um, but yeah, definitely, definitely. So the three natural biohacks. Uh, well, yeah, so, well, we, well, we did say earthing. So that'd be earthing outdoors, obviously. If you can do that, <laughs> that's going to be the better way. Cold therapy, I just think is phenomenal. So ice baths, if you can't get exposure to an ice bath, uh, yeah, have a cold shower. That's going to be the next best thing. Mm. But luckily, I've got one of those Morosco forges here. So, like, I used to just fill up, like, a horse or cattle trough. And I noticed that I'd only do ice baths, like, maybe once to twice a week because there's just there's an inconvenience to go and purchase ice and put it in there, then tip it out. But now I've got this bath, I usually get in there, like, twice a day. So I'm in there usually right. three minutes in the morning and about a minute in the evening because it just takes me too long to warm up in the evening if I go any longer but I use that obviously it does help with the mobilization of fatty acids it helps with inflammation uh, you know I'm just careful not to do it post-workout because we want that hormetic response of inflammation post-workout but the number one reason why I do it Roger is just for emotional stability I don't know if you found this but like I'm probably not the happiest person you know in life and I admit that uh, you know, some people are better than others, but I just find that I'm able to face life that much better with more emotional stability. I don't have highs and then drops. I'm just much more stable by, you know, toning that vagus nerve, especially if I get down and, you know, cover my thyroid, as it were, mm -hmm. and uh, stay in there for a few minutes. For the rest of the day, I'm so much better. Like if I travel and I go to somewhere like India, for instance, and I just cannot get even a cold shower, I feel it. I feel it. So that, that that's just phenomenal for me. Like, what's your feedback on doing cold therapy? Have you noticed anything different like that? I don't have a, I don't have a tub like you do that metal tub. I, I do it. I have a cold shower every day and I don't know. It's, I think everyone's different, aren't they? Some people are responders and other people not as much. And I'm a definite responder. That's why I, I invested in one of those things because I knew that that, that would be uh, priceless for, for myself and my, my mental health. Mm. I, I do, I notice a difference when it comes to uh, using a red light. Sometimes yeah. the sauna, but every time when I use the red light, especially the Advantage 1500, they're powerful. Yeah, like, they are. They're so powerful. I lay under it and I feel like, oh, wow. <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and and yeah, I'm laying there for a bit. And then before I know it, I'm waking up. And I was like, how am I waking up? <laughs> you know, when did I fall asleep? Wow. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's great. And like nothing against Juve, because, you know, I really like the guys at Juve. They're really, really good people. And I had a panel from them uh, before. And I, I like that. But when I tested the red light rising, I am with you. It just feels so much more powerful. So you don't have to spend as much time underneath it for the same effects. That, that, that's, that's, that's what I found uh, from that. Anyway, the other advantage or the other biohack I was going to say is just getting out and having sunlight, especially if you can absorb vitamin D through photobiomodulation. You know, that's vitamin D is like a hormone in itself and just uh, you know setting your circadian rhythm getting the restorative red rays from the sun help with our immune system you just feel so much better you know and uh, i think that's just one of the things especially in this day and age where people are mostly indoors or if they're going to the gym they're doing their double cardio at the gym they're just not getting outdoors and getting the fresh air and the sunlight especially in the morning or at dusk i think that's uh, very very important again because sleep Sleep is the way we heal, you know, that's where we heal our future and not harm it. And if we're not set, set in that circadian rhythm, you know, we're definitely harming our future. Yeah, I love that. Uh, what I'm liking at the moment now, it's, uh, you know, it's spring getting close to summer. So while I'm cycling in the morning, I actually hit the sunrise. So I'm getting that sunrise sun come through. I'm like, yeah, yeah, come on. That's it. Yeah. That's it. It's great. So I'm like, brilliant. Now, Everything is all calibrated in my brain. I'm like, okay, good. I'm, we're done out here. Awesome. I can go indoors now. 
Uh, and, you're multi and you're multitasking, aren't you? You know, a lot of people saying, well, how do I find time to do all this stuff? You yeah. multitask, you do it, you sleep together. Yeah, yeah, very true. Did we lose sound for a second there? Oh, no. I, I can hear you. Can you hear me? Um, yeah, don't know what happened. Must be my end. Yes. Oh, that sounds better. Wait, it did. Okay. okay. <laughs> Is it better? Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's good. Um, I think there was something else you said. Oh, man, it lost me, lost me. But for longevity, um, if somebody wanted to start a, uh, a journey of longevity, where would you suggest they start? It starts with mental health, I think. That, that's where it health. You know, you, you, you start off with, um, you know, setting the proper intentions because, as we know, heart disease is the bigger killer, biggest killer in the world. And it usually comes from stress. So, you know, whether that be utilizing an app to help you with meditation or whether it be a device, you know, something like a, like a Muse or now we have the Apollo, you know, we have so many devices that we can use. And I think that is the way to go, because if you ask anybody to start meditating, they don't know where to start. They don't know how to do it unless you've got a teacher within your vicinity that can help you with guided meditation. A lot of people are gonna give up. And I think that's where a lot of these devices and apps really do help people. Because if you ask people, a lot of the time, if I do a seminar, uh, I'll say, hey, do you guys, have you guys meditated? Yeah, everyone will put their hands up. If I ask them if they meditate, no one does because it's difficult. You know, because sometimes it, it could take five, six months to really get into it. So I think a device of meditation is going to be the first way to start. Because if you cannot find time for yourself with the most important aspect being your mind, then you don't have time for all these other devices and biohacks that, you know, that a lot of people I think are just shiny objects. And I think if I spend money on it, I'm going to get my ROI on it. <laughs> no, you have to put time into it, not, not just money. So I'd say that's going to be the number one. And then obviously you can go down the road of NAD IVs or glutathione IVs and hyperbaric oxygen chambers and all that sort of stuff, which is all great. It's phenomenal, but you know, just like, you know, you're not going to go and compete in a bodybuilding show without training for a couple of years first. So, you know, get get training first and then we can look at uh, HBOT. Yeah, yeah, I like it. What's your what's your thoughts on stem cells, stem cell treatment and all that? I love them. I love them. So I had stem cells that probably be about three and a half years ago now um, in uh, Colombia. So I flew there to get, you know, much more of an efficacious dose that I could in this country or in the UK or anything like that. And um, I had them in my knees, I had them in my shoulders, had them in my elbows, had IV, you know, everywhere that I knew that I would probably go through rear and tear in the future. And I'm actually speaking to the guys at Columbia again about possibly going again this year, because uh, I just think it's, it's, it's probably the best money that I've invested, you know, because I really felt a noticeable difference. and. Uh, yeah, you can have them in, uh, you know, other countries like in the UK and US, you're just not going to get the efficacious dose. And you just don't know if it's stable. So the majority of the banks in this country are stored in Florida. However, I could go up the road and get stem cells, that's fine. But I don't know if it's been temperature controlled, how efficacious, where it's been sourced, where I can go to Columbia and they have the bank there. I see the certificates of the donor, I can see all the tests that the donors went through to ensure that it is clean, you know, and the donors were clean and everything's absolutely fine and above board. And obviously they can be harvested much longer than the 24 hour period than they can in like the U S. Mm -hmm. So instead of, you know, getting 30 million stem cells, I'm able to get six, 600 million stem cells uh, much cheaper as well. So uh, I think it's phenomenal. You know what? Some people have, different views on it but for me personally and you know i've sent clients to columbia to get them as well and they've all reported back the phenomenal changes you know i've noticed when people have it done in their upper bodies and lower bodies upper body responds a lot better and a lot quicker uh you know if people have them in their knees because you are moving even though okay you could say you're not supposed to train for about six weeks post but it's still walking so it doesn't set into the knee uh, capsule or like the hips, 
quite as fast as it does in the upper body. I'll, I'll say that much. Mm -hmm. And what sort of price is on the stem cell treatment? What is there an average price you would say? Yes. Yeah, so for it, it all depends what you want done. So what I had done, uh, it cost me about fifteen thousand dollars. However, I got a price from Har Dr. Harry Adelson, who Amy Killen works for, and a couple of other uh, practitioners here in the, the country. If I had got the same as what I got in Colombia, what it would have cost me north of forty-five thousand dollars, and I wouldn't have had the amount of stem cells as I was able to get in Colombia. And of course, you don't have to go to Colombia. There's places in Peru uh, that do it. There's places in like a, uh, like in the Caribbean, like Jamaica, Russia. There's various places you can go to, but I chose to go to the one in Colombia based on other athletes that I've known that have gone to the same place. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Mm, good to know for people yeah. around the world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It may, you know, people may go, Oh God, that's a little bit pricey, but you know, people will spend that on nice cars or holidays or whatever. I see my investment in my health in the future. You know, mm. I've spent time in uh, retirement villages or old people's homes. And I've heard a lot of regret, you know, unfortunately, and uh, I don't want to be one of those people. I just want to invest in myself so I feel good about myself. And, you know, maybe in my 90s or 100 years old that I'm still seeking adventure and going on my little hikes in the mountains. That's it. Doing the next uh, Ironman or... <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, yeah. Maybe not a Spartan. I'd probably be too scared of heights by that age. <laughs> So lastly, I want to talk about your supplements. You've got like, you, you know, you've got cage muscle. Um, that's been going for how long now? Uh, since December 2014. It's gone oh, quick. Right. Yeah, long oh, time. Really? Long time. Yeah, we, we started off, um, you know, just with single form ingredients like uh, glutamine, uh, citrulline, branched chain amino acids. And we were exclusive to bodybuilding.com in the beginning. So we weren't allowed to sell in like GNCs, vitamin shops, Amazons, or anything like that, because I came from bodybuilding.com yeah. previously as their editor in chief. So I had a good relationship there. So that's how it started. And even though a lot of people thought I was a bit crazy starting with single form ingredients, mm -hmm. I wanted to do something different to ensure uh, that of course we shook the tree a little bit, but just to let people know that sports performance and health, unfortunately in this industry are quite separate from each other. And I wanted to bring them together. So we launched these single form ingredients as fermented forms of amino acids, meaning they were plant derived as opposed to human hair, bird feathers or animal fur, where the majority, like 90% of amino acids in the supplement market are extracted from, you know, wow. which is crazy. So, you know, people even extract like vitamin D from, um, from uh, like sheep's wool, you know, but we like, yeah, but we like to go organic, you know, with the way that we do a lot of the things. So the multivitamin that we got out is all organic. So we call that farmer to table as opposed to pharmacy to table. And same with our greens. We wanted to make sure everything was completely organic in that product as well. So that's kind of the way we go and kind of follow suit of the UK's regulations where everything has to be naturally colored and naturally flavored. We're in the US, you don't have to go that route, but we, we prefer to do that. It's not the cheapest way by any means. I'm not going to be driving around in any sports cars anytime soon, but it, it feeds my purpose. I, I enjoy it. Amazing. So are all the ingredients natural? Oh, no, not all of them. So for instance, okay. if you if you look at something like a beta alanine, like you can't make that naturally. It has to be made in a lab. But what we do is make sure it's the patented version. So a lot of companies will use generic versions of ingredients. Maybe they will cite the studies from the patented versions. We, we call that borrowed science. Uh, but we use the patented ingredients to ensure that they've gone through the studies uh, of efficacy, safety, purity, performance, all, all of that before... You know, so that's why we choose like the patented version of those. That's awesome. And what's the last product that you came out with? The the out something, the green. Outlive. 
Outlive 100. Yeah, Outlive. that was the one before our last one. We just came out with oh. a, a meal replacement called Clean Meal. Okay. Uh, so, so again, that's got organic vitamins and minerals in there, and nothing synthetic in there. So that's a meal replacement. We've got organic quinoa along with Swedish oats as our uh, carbohydrate source in there. So we wanted to make that a complete meal. But the Outlive 100, uh, that came from a, a concoction that I would, I'd been making for about four, about four years where I was mixing in the morning, and it'd take me about 10 minutes, you know, where I'd put different forms of greens, where it'd be spirulina, corella, apple cider vinegar, some lemon juice, some ginger, some turmeric, all this stuff. And I'd mix it together and kind of hold my nose and chug it back. Yeah. And, you know, I'd post that on my stories, and then so many people were tagging me doing the same thing, because I'd hashtag live to 100. And mm. it, just, it just caught a lot of momentum. So then spoke to my formulator on C to see if we could do something that had complete transparency of the label to show how much is of in each ingredient in here, along with, you know, adaptogens like, you know, KSM 66, uh, ashwagandha, et cetera, and mm. flavor it so it tastes good as well. So he was able to put it together, naturally flavored it and colored it, and it tastes great. And uh, so that's that's how Outlive 100, and it just it, now it takes me one minute to to put together and knock back. That's good, man. Like I, when I make a, a, let's say a smoothie, I put so much stuff in there. With the with, I do have a kind of greens one as well, where I might put uh, I'll put some fruit in there. But yeah, the uh, the spirulina and the um, uh, chlorella. chlorella, those two are together. And then I've got, I do have some ashwagandha, but yeah, I might have that in the evening. And then I've got chaga, but I'll put that in my coffee. I'll have the chaga with, um, I'll have reishi in the evening. Um, I'm just trying to look, I'm just, just, I'm reading the labels in my head, you know. Um, oh, what there's, is the other one? There's, there's lion's mane? Lion's mane in the morning, yeah, yeah. lion's mane. Um, I have quite a bit of lion's mane actually, because there's some in some other products that I have. There's a there's a, there's another there's a supplement which I got recently, and it's got lion's mane in it. It's called Wicked Naturals, uh, but you obviously wouldn't be interested in that. You've already got a cage muscle. Well, well, no, no, the mushrooms. No, we don't do mushrooms. So the mushrooms that I usually take is like from leads. Uh, that's what I usually take because they've got the functional mushrooms. But I'm all about that because, you know, it's been shown that it can help with like neuroplasticity, which I'm all about. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm definitely on the, on the mushroom uh, bandwagon. Oh, brilliant, man. Brilliant. What was, you said something 66. What was the name of that? ASM 66. So that is the patented version of ashwagandha. So, uh, you know, what I've done, uh, you know, like KSM 66, that's actually uh, located in South India. So I've actually gone to their manufacturing plants. It's the same with the organic caffeine that we use in our products. Uh, that's uh, called Pure Caf, again, situated on the farms in India. So we've actually gone to these farms and these manufacturing plants and filmed the process to show how they're extracted, how it, the, these products are cleaned, how they're purified, um, you know, just to show the efficacy of it, you know, over say generic ingredients, because as an example, I'm gonna digress quickly here. We just came out with an, uh, an omega-3 supplement. Now I'd say the fish oil industry is probably the worst of all ingredients. Like I've seen down in uh, South America where they have literally scraped the mold from the top of the vat that it's been stored in to then to purify it, to, to, just to put into the, the gel caps. You know, it's like unbelievable. And it's just rancid. It, it, you'd be better off like not taking yeah. a, a supplement, you know? So we wanted to make sure that we went one higher of uh, you know what people are doing and we're just sustainably sourced and they're sourced at the time that they are caught from the fishery you know wild caught as opposed to farmed fish and uh, mm. you know it's just amazing what's out there so uh, we actually go to these plants and we'll film that so the consumer can see exactly where their powder where their product is coming from like i said it it, yeah. it doesn't make us much money doing it this route but look i would hope 
somebody out there would make that effort for my hard-earned money. Yeah. So we just want to do the same. Like, I want to feel good, just like, you know, I'm not a father, you're a father, but you want to feel good if you're going to give a supplement to your daughter that it isn't contaminated. And I'm the same way. I've got nieces in Wales. I want to feel the same way if they were to take it. You know, I send my supplements to uh, my family. You know, I want to make sure that they're taken care of. If we don't do a certain supplement, I will order supplements and send them over. Like, you know, um, Body Bio, they do great fats. And I'll get them, you know, sent to, sent to my parents. I want to make sure that they're taken care of. Yeah, they do uh, sodium... Uh, sodium butyrate. Yeah, yeah, great product. Yeah, like short-chain that. fatty acids. Yeah, and the yeah. coenzyme Q10 is awesome. Mm -hmm. They've got a great tabka, which is obviously great for the, for the, for the kidneys as well. I mm -hmm. love the products. I was going to say, the, the glutamine I got from Cage Muscle recently, um, I actually, I'll give, that, I'll give some of that to my daughter as well. I'll put that in a glass of water, I'll like neck that. Yeah, that's a good. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's yeah. all fermented. It's all yeah. fermented. Exactly. That you know, because I wanted to get it, but I was like, all right, whatever I get, I want to make sure certain things. Obviously, she won't have, but um, I want to make sure that I feel it's safe that I know that she can have it. So I'll give her that as well. Um, oh, there was something else I'm going to say. Yeah. Last thing. How old do you want to live to? Like what age? I'm good with 100 years old. 100, yeah. But but what's most important to me is that I'm fully functional. You know, I still have my hearing. I still have my eyesight. I'm still <laughs> active. I'm still mobile. And it's coming quick, you know. And I think that's why it's important to be mindful and present in the moment and not stressing about the future or the past. And that's why I like to feel. You know, I, I like to focus, at, you know, for instance, if you're going out on your bike in the morning and like I do the same, I want to feel that rotation. I want to feel the air in my in my face or what, whatever, because then I know I'm present. Then I know I'm in the moment. If I'm thinking, I may be thinking about the future or worrying about the fast, uh, worrying about the fast, uh, the past. And then all of a sudden I'm 18, 90, 100 years old and it's just gone just like that. So it's very important to feel right now. What about you? What's your goal? Um, I want to, I want to go past the hundred. Um, I want to get to about, I don't know, about 103. Okay. I think a hundred uh, in my head, I feel as though a hundred is kind of easy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I just want to go past it. It's like he lived past a hundred and you know, I want to be doing some really functional stuff as well to show people it can be done. Um, it's like, I, I love the weight training and stuff. Um, it's great, but I want to show people um, that it's possible to look amazing when you're much older. That's what I want to do as well. You know, I, I want to be that guy because I've seen people in their 60s looking amazing. And, that, and to me, in my head, already that is average. I mean, it looks good. It looks great because I'm not even there yet, but I've already contemplated I'm definitely going to look like that in my 60s. So in my head, I'm trying to push it to like around 70s, 80s, where people are looking at me like, wow, how do you do that? And in doing that, I know that I'm going to have um, great metabolic function and I just see it as 100 should be quite average. And I, I want to push over. If I can around 103, possibly 104 or something like that. I already that's, see it in my head. That's a, that's a good mindset to have because if you're going to invite that into your universe, chances are it's going to be part of your, of your reality. And like I've known you for about 10 years now and you just seem to be getting better with age. So I don't doubt that one bit. How old are you now? I'm 42. 42. Yeah, I don't doubt it one bit. I don't doubt it one bit. You'll get there. You'll get Thank there. you. And I know that you'll get there, man. You're looking fantastic. Like you might not, you might not even say that for yourself. Like you always compliment me and thank you so much. But you look incredible. You're saying you're almost 47, bro. I see 47 in August, yeah. That's insane, man. That's insane. Well, we live a we live a healthy lifestyle, you know. It's, uh, I, th I think we're able to sell that. I remember when I first met my wife like five years ago. She came to the gym, you know, I didn't persuade her. She just wasn't a gym rat at all. But then when she met a couple of my friends that, were, that are mothers and, uh, you know, they're at the gym, she's like, 
you're how old? You know, they were in their forties and she's like, I'm sold. You know, she stopped eating what she was eating and stopped, you know, kind of hanging out with a lot of the people she was hanging out with. And I think it's a very easy sell and it's no coincidence. It's like, look, okay. You, you know, if you eat a certain way, if you hydrate a certain way, if you sleep a certain way, then of course it's going to show itself internally and externally as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Man, more questions has come in, but do you know what? Got to cap it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, Chris. Thank you. Like, it's always a pleasure chatting, bro. It's all, yeah. To be out yeah. there, I don't know, training together, meeting up in India, doing some tours and stuff. <laughs> yeah, we, all, we always have some fun, man. But at least if we get together in the US and the UK, we get some sleep. We don't get that in India. You know, it's always there to there to there. Jag works us really hard when we're there, you know? There's so, the whip. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I just I just got my citizenship. Now I have to wait for my passport. Could be a couple of months, but this, the day that that passport comes, mate, I'll be over there. So we'll definitely have to hook up. Definitely, bro. So uh, where can people find you? So you're on Instagram. What's your handle on there? Yeah, Chris, it's probably best if people just go to my Instagram, to be honest with you. It's Chris Gethin, K-R-I-S-G-E-T-H-I-N. Cool, brilliant. And that's it. Just want to... Are you on Twitter? I don't think I've seen you. I'm not, yeah, I'm not really on there that often. You know, I, I am on there. I'm just not that active. I'm on Facebook a little bit more, I'd say, because yeah. I do have private groups uh, on Facebook, so I am there. But Instagram or Facebook, it's the same name, Chris Gethin. On Twitter, it's actually Caged Muscle. That's K-A-G-E-D Muscle, M-U-S-C-L-E. That's that's my personal handle on there. Okay, awesome, awesome. Chris, thank you very much for your time, my friend. It's been phenomenal. And uh, yeah, let's catch up again, man. Maybe I could be on your podcast. <laughs> you can indeed. It'd be rude not to, but I want to put this on my YouTube as well, brother. So if I could get a version, I'd be happy, happy as Larry to throw this up. Absolutely, brother. Absolutely. You have a phenomenal day. I'm going to drink some water and chill for a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you do it, my man. Okay, cheers. Great talking to you, Roger. Peace. Pleasure. See you.